So, hello everybody. Our speaker today is Antonio de Rosa um, from the University of Maryland, and he will talk about regularity of anisotropic minimal surfaces. Thank you very much for coming, and please go ahead. Thank you very much, Armin, for the nice introduction, and thanks to all the organizers for the kind invitation. It's, it's a pleasure for me uh, to give a talk at this online seminar in geometric analysis. So as Armin has already announced, I will talk about regularity uh, for anisotropic minimal surfaces. And, but before to start and going uh, into the core of the talk, let me uh, briefly give a, an overview of what is this uh, research and this talk about. So in um, geometric analysis, there is a very rich theory, as we know, about minimal surfaces. And as we all know, I'm sure in the audience, minimal surfaces are simply critical points of the area functional. And they appear naturally to model several natural phenomena. And just a classical example, but it's not the only one, are soap films that are the soap structures that you get when you put an iron stream into the soap and when you take it back. However, in material science and engineering, the area functional often uh, can turn out to be an idealization. Sometimes you need to consider more general energies and isotropic energies, which are not invariant by translation or rotation of uh, your configurations. Uh, this was already observed by Gibbs, who in the 19th century introduced anisotropic energies to model crystals. And as you can see in the slides, crystal structures have polyhedral shapes. And the reason is that they minimize energies which give different weights to different possible tangent planes of the boundary. Of course, there are other applications, for instance, in, in pure mathematics, there are uh, essentially the equivalent of insular geometry, so putting in an isotropic norm on the, on the normal bundle, on the tangent bundle. Um, trying to extend uh, the well-established literature for isotropic minimal surfaces to be an isotropic world is a difficult task. And the reason is the lack of many tools that are true for the area functional, are true for the special symmetries of the area, but they completely fail in the anisotropic world. So this is what I will try to convey along the talk, but I would like to emphasize that the main goal of what I will present is to build a robust anisotropic theory. And let me, in order to motivate the results that I'm gonna present that are essentially related to the regularity of anisotropic minimal surfaces, I would like to start as a simple motivation with the plateau problem, because this is probably a very classical geometric valuational problem. And at, just at the very beginning, I will talk about the area functional so that I can tell you what are the tools that we have for the area that we will completely miss when we go to the anisotropic world. So the plateau problem consists in finding a surface which minimizes the area among all the surfaces which has the same prescribed boundary condition. For instance, in this slide, the boundary condition is this um, uh, iron stream, and when you put into the soap, you get this soap structure that you can see as an area, an area minimizer. And an immediately related question is a regularity question, that is, can I study the structural property of it? So for instance, in this case, you see that there are points that are not smooth points. And um, of course, the plateau problem has a long history. There is a huge literature about the plateau problem for the area functional. But however, this is not in the scope of this talk. I was just want just to use this as a motivation. So let me very brief about what I'm going to say, and I will skip. So this is a very important remark. I will skip all the literature review. Uh, I just wanted to say very broadly, you can imagine the plateau problem as the minimization of the d of measure of the area of surfaces K, which belongs to a, a certain family of competitors that I'm calling pH. So pH, I'm calling, I'm denoting it pH because I'm imagining that this family, this class, has some relation to a boundary condition with respect to a boundary set H, but I'm being very vague here. So you can imagine pH to be, for instance, a family of rectifiable sets that are closed under limits of isotopies that are not deforming the boundary age, just to have an example. Um, just a small remark for everyone, it, it just a reminder, because it will be useful for the rest of the talk. When I say that the set is rectifiable, this essentially means that 
the set as a good notion of tangent plane at almost every point of the set, okay? You can have in mind intuitive example of rectifiable set that are just Lipschitz surfaces. We know by Rademacher that they have a good tangent plane at almost every point. Now, if you want to solve this problem, or again, there is a long history, so I'm not going into the literature just to use it, just for me to use it as a motivation. Um, I got a, a result with uh, Guido De Filippis and Francesco Giraldin uh, a few years ago, showing that if you take a minimizing sequence in this class, this will subconverge uh, in the sense of Radon measure to a minimal set, to a set K, which has the minimal area. And you can prove also sharp regularity. That means that this set K is real analytic outside of a singular set, uh, outside of a singular set of other dimension at most D minus one. I just want to emphasize that this is in general co-dimension, but um, this result for the co-dimension one case was already proved. So when you are looking at hypersurfaces in RN was already proved by Harrison proved in 2016 and uh, by the Lelis Giraldine Maggi uh, in 2017. There are also relevant results by David, by Zwaomir Kolasinski, by um, several other authors that have worked on this topic. And so this uh, literature is not at all exhaustive. I just wanted to use this as a, an example of motivation. Now, why am I saying this? Because what is the proof idea in this kind of result? The idea is the following. You would like to apply the direct method of the calculus of variation but you immediately fall in trouble because both compactness and lower semi-continuity are not really true for, for surfaces and for the area of surfaces. So you need to use a slightly different approach to be able to apply the calculus of variation methods. And then idea is the following. I look at the, my set kj, my sequence kj, not as a sequence of sets, but as a sequence of measure, which means that to each kj, I associate a measure that is the house of measure restricted to KJ, okay? Now, immediately my surfaces are now just measures. So I am in a good shape because I have good compactness and lower semi-continuity property because measures are a dual space. So I have Banakal Oglu. So they converge uh, to a measure mu that is our candidate minimizer. Why do I say candidate minimizer? Because a priori mu is just a measure, it's not really a, a, a surface, okay? And you may have some abstraction in mind. For instance, this is a, thought, a picture that is courtesy of Frank Morgan. So um, for instance, you can imagine even in the simple case in which, uh, in which the or boundary is just a two dimension, a one dimensional circle and the minimizer is the two dimensional disk, you can approximate it with area minimizing sequences, which are done in the following way. You are creating first a bump in the middle of the disk. You make the bump thinner and thinner. And doing it thinner and thinner, you can add many of them. So you can make a lot of tentacles which are invading the wall space. So how do you say that at the limit in the end, you are still recovering the two dimensional disk? Well, I'm not going into the technicalities because it's, this is not the scope of the talk, but I just want to emphasize that a big hammer that you can prove and use in this uh, for the area functional is the monotonicity formula, which tells you that the measure of your minimizer in a ball of radius r rescaled by r power d is a non-decreasing function in r. This, you can use several techniques. You can use price theorem. You can use several tools that allows you all to conclude that from monotonicity formula that the measure mu is indeed the rectifiable measure. That is, that is a density times the Diausdorf measure restricted to a rectifiable set K. And then, I mean, the result is not done. Of course, you need more refined analysis to prove that the density is exactly one and stratification argument to prove the sharp regularity that is that the dimension of the singular set is at most E minus one. But I want to emphasize again for the area functional as I'm emphasizing again, you have this powerful monotonicity formula that you can prove and use. However, now that you move to the anisotropic world, the situation gets much worse. And the reason is that the monotonicity formula is known to be false, is not true. It's not that we are not able to prove it. There is a, a result of Allard in the 80s that tells you that essentially this is a 
uh, a characterization of the area function of the monotonicity formula. But let's go step by step. What are anisotropic energies? They were introduced already a long time ago in material science, as I mentioned, but in geometric measure theory, probably they were firstly studied by Almgren in the 60s. And they are obtained in the following way. You take a, your surface and you integrate over your surface an integrand f, which depends on the point x and on the tangent space of your surface at that point. So the integrand f is a, functional, is a function defined on the Grassmannian bundle. Uh, so Rn times the D-Grassmannian, where the D-Grassmannian is the set of the D-dimensional linear subspaces of Rn. Now, as you can see immediately, this is not invariant by translation or rotation of your configurations. Why? Because if you translate, you change x, and if you rotate, you change the tangent space, okay? And for the sake of the exposition, let me remove the dependence on x. I'm not really cheating in doing so. Why? Because I'm gonna present a regularity results. So you can imagine they are local in nature. And if you zoom, if you blow up enough at a given point, your integrand up to some regularity assumption will be frozen in x. So let me skip the dependence on x. Now you can imagine to formulate an isotropic plateau problem in your class PH as the minimization of the anisotropic energy of the sets K that belong to this class PH. And now you would like to say, can I prove similar result as the one of the I showed you before? Well, the answer is, is not that easy. And the reason is that, again, I want to restress this thing. The monotonicity formula will not hold. It's false for general energies. So you need to find an alternative. Uh, we want to replace the monotonicity formula, and we need to find an alternative strategy. How can we do it? Well, the, an approach that you can follow is to study weaker notion of surfaces that are called varifolds. I know that in the audience there are big, big experts in the theory of varifolds, so they will excuse me if I remind um, for, for everyone what a varifold is. So a varifold is simply a positive random measure on the Grassmannian bundle. Okay, so Rn times the Grassmannian. What does it mean heuristically? It means that essentially you have a smooth surface, this one in blue, and then at almost every point of this surface, you can assign a, a probability measure on the Grassmannian that you can see essentially as a local statistics of the possible tangent plane at that point. Okay, why are these objects useful? Well, first of all, they appear in compactness results, they appear very easily as limit of smooth surfaces, as you can see in this picture. And also they are not new objects in geometric measure theory. They are reminiscent, for instance, from PDE material sciences, from uh, quasi-convex energies. When you study microstructures, you can see that there are some materials that they have macroscopically a flat uh, surface, but microscopically at very small scales, they present corrugation that can be seen as a local statistics of tangent planes. You can have in mind, for instance, for people familiar with this, uh, they are essentially the equivalent of the Young measures from PD. And just you can also think at intuitive notion of uh, varifolds that are the rectifiable varifolds, which are obtaining taking a rectifiable measure, HD restricted to a rectifiable set. And on the Grassmannian, you put a Dirac delta on the tangent plane of that uh, rectifiable set. Now, varifolds are weak notion of surface, so you can imagine that I can extend the concept of anisotropic energy to every varifold, simply integrating over the varifold, the integrand f. And as soon as you have an energy and you have a surface, you can define the first variation, as Lagrange would have done already a long time ago, simply taking the vector field G that is C1 compactly supported in Rn, you take the one parameter family of diffeomorphism generated, that is the identity plus Tg, and you take the derivative in T at equal zero of the energy of the deformation of your variable through the map phi T. Okay, so this defines very classically the first variation. And with this very small toolkit in your hand, I can tell you the first result that I want to present, the first regularity result for an isotropic minimal surfaces that I want to present today, that is a weak regularity result. Which, why weak? Because uh, this result tells you that if you are given an integrand that is C1, and you, can cons and you consider the class of variables 
which has first variation that is a radon measure, sorry, an isotropic first variation that is a radon measure and positive density, then every variable in this class is rectifiable if and only if the integrand f satisfies a certain condition that we have introduced with my co-authors, uh, Guido De Filippis and Francesco Giraldin, and uh, we have denoted as atomic condition. Now, let me emphasize briefly why this result is important. First of all, this result was proved for the first time by Allard in the 70s for the area functional, for f equal one. And however, his proof was deeply relying on the monotonicity formula. Um, in uh, the proof strategy was very linked to the monotonicity formula. And this is why it has been open for the last five decades because it was real, it, it, the proof couldn't be extended to anisotropic energies. And indeed to get this proof, we needed to introduce new tools based on the analysis on the dimensional analysis of the spaces of invariance of the blowups through harmonic analysis. And uh, in other small comments, for people that may be slightly less familiar with this notation, when I say that the anisotropic first variation is a random measure, I simply mean that essentially the mean curvature, the weak mean curvature is a measure. And also this assumption of positive density is a necessary assumption, otherwise the result would be false. Okay. But now you may ask me a question at this point, you may say, well, Oh, yes, I see a question. Uh, um, I wanted to ask, is f um, elliptic or is it just any C1 function? Yeah, actually, this is a very good question. Thank you very much. And indeed, as I was saying, uh, I emphasize it in uh, with the, uh, we, I, I don't know if you, if one can see the emphasized uh, blue that I can put. So uh, is not only is not true for every C1 function, but we characterize the result in the meaning that we know all and the only function for which is true. And the function for which is true are these one that I'm denoting in blue that satisfy this condition that we, we introduced actually this condition, we call it atomic condition. And for the rest of the talk, I will really uh, put a lot of effort in uh, trying to understand what this atomic condition means. So, uh, but uh, this is a very good point. Uh, thank you very much. So this result is not only not true for every C1 function, but we, we prove that the result is true if and only if this ellipticity condition, atomic condition holds. So, oh, so uh, does it imply ellipticity in the sense of Ombren? Well, that's a very another good point. So you're covering my result, the, the result that I'm presenting. Yes, the answer is, well, uh, what I will prove is that this atomic condition is implying the Almgren ellipticity, the strict okay. Almgren ellipticity condition. And then I will say something also on the reverse, but uh, yes, this, these are very good points and are indeed the content of my next like 10, 15 slides. So <laughs> thank you very oh, much. I, I just did have one other question. When you say yes. the density is bigger than zero, is that for almost every point or is it a uniform bound? That's an, a very, a, another great question. Um, this is, I, I was indeed very slightly sloppy here. Uh, what I really mean here is that this is really density positive. So if you have a variable that is a, has a positive density at almost every at almost every point, and so not uniform, really strictly positive, oh, but it may nice. change. Yeah. It may maybe may change on x. You can prove the result. Not only that, but you can also localize the result. So I, here I presented a slightly weaker version. You can also say take any variable without the positive density assumption, and take the part of the variable. Uh, the variable oh, okay. restricted to the set of positive density, yeah. then the rectifiability theorem is true for, for just for that part. So not uh, so you can also localize the result. Yes, but to answer direct, directly to the question, uh, indeed, is uh, you don't need the uniform lower density bound. You just need uh, strictly positive density, which may depend on the point, of course. Yes. Thank you very much for the very good, the, the great the, the great question. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, uh, indeed, uh, as it was pointed out um, uh, through these questions, the result is true if and only if we have this ellipticity condition that I'm gonna present soon. But before doing that, let me say that since I gave as a motivation the plateau problem, let me conclude the motivation. Indeed, then with these results, we can reprove the same result we got for the area functional, also for the anisotropic setting. That was our original motivation, but um, uh, so we can prove that given a minimizing sequence of for the anisotropic energies, they will weak star converge 
sub weak star converge to a radon, to, in the sense of radon measures to a rectifiable set K, which has minimal energy. And also I want to emphasize that with these results, you can recover some other classical solution of the problem. So from here, we recover the result of Reifenberg, the result of Almgren and David, the result of Harrison Cook, and, uh, and so on. Uh, and let me emphasize that for these results, there, are, there have been also some results using uh, similar results using for the solution of the plateau problem using different techniques from Fang and Kolasinski. Okay, so now let me go to the to the this question of what is this electricity condition? It will be a bit involved the atomic condition, so I need to give you some further notation. So first of all, let me remind for everyone that the anisotropic first variation of a variable can be uh, represented as the integration of a certain matrix BFT against the scalar, uh, scalar product with the gradient of your vector field G. Now, this matrix BFT, is a, you can imagine it as a projection matrix. Indeed, for the area functional, for F equal one, this is exactly T. So the projection of Rn into the tangent plane T. Okay? Now, since your variable carries a probability measure on the Grassmannian, you would like to look an average of these projections. So this pushes us to define this next matrix A nu, which is essentially the integration of the projection BFT over the probability measure mu on the Grassmannian. Okay, so this is an average of the projection matrices that you can see, for instance, at a point. Now, the atomic condition looks like the following. You will say that F satisfies AC if and only if. First, the dimension of the kernel of this matrix has to be less or equal than n minus d for every uh, probability measure mu on the Grassmannian. And it's equal to n minus d if and only if the measure mu is a direct delta. Now, I know this looks very algebraic, so it's very not intuitive, but let me try to give you some intuition about this. First of all, for the area functional, this is pretty obvious. Why? Because for the area functional, again, BFT is just the matrix T, the projection on the tangent plane. Indeed, uh, if you are integrating projections operator, which have each, each of them as kernel n minus d dimensional, when you integrate them, the dimension of the kernel will decrease, okay? This is the content of the first condition. So the dimension of the kernel will decrease. And the second condition is telling you that it has to decrease, right? So the only case in which the dimension of the kernel is not decreasing is when you are not really integrating. You are considering always the same orthogonal projection, okay? So you are not losing anything in the kernel. Well, but still now you may ask, well, for general energies, what does this mean? And there is a problem. This atomic condition may be not easy to check. Uh, if I give you an integral, how do you check if this condition is true, right? So you have to check that for every matrix A mu, for every probability measure, you have to check the dimension of this kernel. It may be not easy. So you would like to characterize this condition. And in codimension one, we had a pretty good answer in the meaning that we proved that if D is equal to N minus one, so for hypersurfaces, the atomic condition is equivalent to the strict convexity of the one homogeneous extension of the function G that you can construct by duality. So what do I mean by this? Now you are in codimension one, you are looking at hyperplanes from F defined on hyperplanes, you can define a G by duality on the orthogonal of the hyperplanes, right? On the unitary vectors, okay? So G of nu is just F of nu orthogonal. And you extend this by one homogeneity. And you ask, and Saying that F satisfies AC is equivalent to say that G is strictly convex, of course, in the spherical direction, not in the radial one, because in the radial one, you are just linear. So you are just weakly convex. So what I mean is essentially this. This is the precise notion of strict convexity in this case. So very good answer for codimension one. So we know a lot of strictly convex function, and these are the only one for which you can prove the rectifiability theorem, otherwise it's false. But what about higher codimension? Do, you, do we have any understanding uh, in higher codimension? Well, until very recently, we didn't have any understanding, but very recently in this uh, work of mine with um, another coder of mine, which is Zwaomir Polasiski, which is 
I can see this also in the audience. Um, uh, so he, he, uh, we, what we proved is that for every co-dimension, so for every D less or equal than N minus one, the atomic condition implies the Almgren strict geometric ellipticity. That is exactly what Professor Ilmanen was uh, mentioning before, but I would like maybe to, uh, to tell this condition to everyone. This condition is telling you that the energy of a surface is strictly bigger than the energy of a disk every time your surface has the same boundary of the disk. When I say as the same boundary, I really mean that you cannot retract your surface with the Lipschitz deformation over the boundary of the disk. This is the real meaning of having the same boundary. But if you don't, if you have never seen this condition, you can imagine these as a really a geometric version of the classical quasi-convexity. Okay, so let me say a few things of how me and Zwavek proved this result. And I want to do it because this is the, the idea. It gives you a lot of geometric intuition about this condition. So first of all, the atomic condition is pu purely algebraic. So you want to rephrase it in geometric words. How do you do it? We found a, an alternative condition, which is equivalent to AC. We proved to be equivalent to AC. That is the following. The property is that every time you have a manifold W that is a d-dimensional plane, and then on the Grassmannian part, you can put any constant measure you want, then this variable will be stationary if and only if the measure mu is the Dirac delta on that plane, okay? So saying that F satisfies the atomic condition is equivalent to this property. This is the first thing we prove. Second thing, with this condition, we can solve the anisotropic plateau problem. And in particular, we can, this means that with AC, we can solve the anisotropic plateau problem. Third thing that we have to introduce are homogenization techniques that I will uh, present shortly. And fourth, we need to combine all these with some algebraic topology argument. Let me now give the proof. Let me combine these four steps with some uh, picture, picture, uh, picture proof, let's say. So you want to prove that atomic condition implies Almgren ellipticity. Assume that's not true. So it means that there will exist a surface which has the same boundary of the disk but has less energy than the disk, okay? The surface is in red and the, the disk is in blue. You may say, well, I don't see any disk, I see just a cube. Well, they are the same up to Lipschitz deformation. So let me do this proof for cubes rather than disk, but the proof uh, doesn't change because it's really, they are really equivalent. Now, since I can solve the anisotropic plateau problem using AC, I can replace the surface in red with uh, the solution of the anisotropic plateau problem associated. So this S is also stationary away from the boundary of the disk. What I do now is the, what we did with Zwarek is the following. We rescale the surface at size one over N. We tile N power D copies of these surfaces and we obtain the following new surface S prime. Okay, this S prime by scaling has the same energy of S which is less than the energy of the disk of the cube. Now, this S prime N will converge to a certain varifold V in the limit. And now what you would like to say is that the varifold V here is stationary. How can you do it? Well, if I know that S prime N solves the plateau problem, then it will be automatically stationary outside of the boundary of the disk. But this is not easy, right? Because although S prime N and S have the same energy, no one is telling you that they have the same boundary of the disk. So you need to prove that S prime N cannot be retracted on the boundary of the disk. And this is not an easy task. If you think there are, if I was tiling, I was gluing surfaces that are of different shapes, you may lose this property. You can imagine like the Adam surface. So you can imagine gluing the Mabius strip and the tribal Mabius strip, you can lose this property. But in this case, since you have this specific structure of gluing the same surface and power D times, we, by, by exploiting some algebraic topology work, we, we work in algebraic topology and we can prove that indeed the boundary is the same. So in particular, the variable D is stationary and we deduce that this variable that can be written in the following way as the D-dimensional plane D cross a measure mu times a certain density, which lives on the plane because just simply by homogenization, 
is indeed rectifiable because since it's stationary and it satisfies the geometric reformulation of AC, implies that mu is indeed a direct delta on the tangent on, on the plane. So the manifold is indeed rectifiable at the end. And we can conclude with the following contradiction. We say then, well, the energy of the disk has to be strictly smaller than the energy of the manifold simply because the density is strictly bigger than one. And this is just by homogenization. But the energy of the manifold has to be the energy of S prime n, which is the energy of S, which was less than the energy of D. So you get the contradiction. And in particular, you have proved our results. OK, so um, uh, this proves this result. But now you may ask, well, is the then, uh, is there a question from uh, then? Ah, no, OK, sorry, it's a, it's a clap. Sorry, I confused the, the, the emoji. OK, um, so um, now you may ask yourself a question. Uh, you say, well, I, am I done with this result? Well, no, because there are some question that comes out again to your mind. You say, first of all, I got a necessary condition for the validity of AC, that is the Almgren electricity. What about a sufficient condition to AC? This is the first question. Second question, can I find the non-trivial example of energies which satisfy the atomic condition in general co-dimension in order to justify the regularity theory that I have presented? Third question, can I upgrade the rectifiability theorem to a C1 alpha regularity? What do I mean by this? I mean that Allard in the 70s proved something stronger for the area functional. He proved that if f is equal to 1, then a rectifiable manifold, which is stationary, or for instance, has LP, uh, mean curvature in LP with respect to the mass of the manifold, and with P bigger than D, then if the density is equal to one, the manifold is C1 alpha. So can we prove something similar for anisotropic energies? And this is, these three questions are the content of the remaining of the talk, okay? So first thing, let's start. What is a sufficient condition to get AC? This is some work that I've recently done with a postdoc in uh, Lausanne, Riccardo Tione, he's, at a, at a, he's a postdoc at uh, EPFL. What we introduced is a new condition that I know it seems like another condition, but you will see soon how useful it will be to provide information on, on AC. So the condition is the following. We denote F conjugate uh, to be the dual integrand of F. So basically F conjugate of S orthogonal is equal to F of S, is defined on the dual Grassmannian. So we say that F satisfies the scalar atomic condition if the scalar product between BFT and BF conjugate S orthogonal is positive every time T is different from S. And let me emphasize that if you write down this condition for codimension one, this becomes exactly the strict convexity. The problem is that when you go to high codimension, there are a lot of possible notion, possible properties that can collapse in the strict convexity. This is a, a very important problem, right? So there are a lot of notion of convexity that when you write them in uh, co-dimension one, they all collapse to strict, to convex, to the usual convexity. So this is one of them that we introduce and I will show why it's important. Um, and then we can give a uniform version of it saying that this scalar product has to be bigger or equal than uh, the square norm of T minus S. Now, the first thing that we prove with Ricardo is that the scalar atomic condition implies the atomic condition. So this is a sufficient condition to the validity of AC. So let me first tell you how we do it. And second, I will tell you why this result is useful to tell something about AC. So first thing, how do we prove it? Well, imagine that we do it for the area functional, just for simplicity. BFT is just T. BF conjugate S orthogonal, in this case, very simply now is just S orthogonal. So you want to prove that for every probability measure mu such that the dimension of the kernel of A mu is bigger or equal than N minus D, then uh, mu is a Dirac delta. Well, the dimension of the kernel is bigger or equal than N minus D. So I'm doing, I'm not cheating if I take a subspace of the kernel, which is N minus D dimensional, and I call it S orthogonal, okay? So I can test A mu with S orthogonal. This is a subspace of the kernel, so it will be zero on one end on the left. But on the, right, on the other end, if I use linearity, this is really the scalar product between T and S orthogonal in D mu. And now here, 
For general energies, you conclude using the scalar atomic condition. For the area functional, you just conclude saying that this quantity is always uh, non-negative and strictly positive if t, is different from, if t is different from s. So in particular, you deduce that mu is a Dirac delta in s, okay? Now, why this scalar atomic condition implying AC is useful? Because it allows us to say something about the second question. Are there non-trivial example of energy satisfying AC in general co-dimension? In co-dimension one, we know all of them, the strict convex, strictly convex function. But in general co-dimension, we didn't know any function beside the area functional that was satisfying the AC, okay? So there was no other example, at least uh, that, that I'm aware of and that I was able to, we were able to prove. And with Riccardo Tione, what we did in the same paper is to show that uh, the uniform scalar atomic condition is open in the C2 topology, which means that F satisfying the uniform scalar atomic condition implies that every F prime, which is epsilon close in the C2 norm to F, still satisfies the uniform scalar atomic condition. And since the uniform scalar implies the scalar atomic condition, in particular, we deduce that an entire C2 neighborhood of the area functional satisfies the atomic condition, okay? And notice that these are the first non-trivial example satisfying this AC in general co-dimension. And uh, so this is to address the second question, but I will say a bit more about the second question at the very end of the talk. Let me for the moment go to the third question. Can we upgrade the rectifiability theorem to a C1 alpha regularity? Well, the answer is, for general manifolds, we still don't know. This is work in progress, long-term long work in progress. This requires a lot of work, but we have a, an answer. Uh, we have uh, an answer in the case the starting manifold is not a general manifold, but is a Lipschitz graph, okay? So if you start, if you have a function f that is C2 and satisfies the uniform scalar atomic condition, if you take a Lipschitz graph in every co-dimension, so the graph has value in R power n minus d, and the graph has f mean curvature in LP with p bigger than the dimension, then the graph will be C1 alpha in a top than eight in a full measure set. So in a set omega zero, which has almost the same measure, which has the same measure as the domain omega of the function. So let me emphasize that in particular, thanks to the previous slide, this result holds in an epsilon C2 neighbor of the area, okay? Of course, for the area functional, this is a consequence of the more general result for every stationary variables, which is known just for the area functional. So it was proved by Allard in Annals in the 70s for F equal one. Okay, so how do you prove this result? The idea is that we get to obtain a Cacciopoli inequality. And from there, it will be, the thing is, the thing becomes easy. The way to get the Cacciopoli inequality is to find the right way, the right projection operator in the first variation expression. So the first variation of a graph reads as follow is the B is the matrix BF against the plane, the tangent plane T, scalar product, the gradient of the vector field G. And this will be equal to the error term given the, by the mean curvature. Now, what we plug in is this vector field. Of course, once you know it, the computation becomes easy. The difficulty was also to find, was really to find also the right vector field and the right projection operator here, that is BF conjugate turned out to be BF conjugate as orthogonal. And the reason is that when the gradient here in G hits the, this part, then you will get exactly the test between BF, T, and BF conjugate as orthogonal, which will be lower bounded by the square distance between T and S. When instead the gradient hits the cutoff function, you get the standard error terms, which gives you the L2 distance of your, um, uh, of the zero order term. This is really a geometric Cacciopoli inequality. Indeed, you can rewrite it in an analytic way as the L2 average distance of the gradient of U from a matrix A is bounded from above by the L2 uh, average distance of U from the linear expansion, from the first order linear expansion. So you get really the standard Cacciopoli inequality. 
And from now, given the audience, uh, I see many experts. So given the audience, I'm sure from now is pretty clear where this goes. So from this, you can, you can use this to prove a decay of the excess. So the excess that is the average distance, the average L2 distance of the gradient of U from its average can be proved to, to decay, which means that if the excess falls below a certain threshold epsilon, then it starts decaying geometrically in the radius. Okay. Now, this is a bit the um, some answer to the three questions that I posed. But now I would like to conclude in the remaining, uh, I guess, five, 10 minutes that I am left with. I would like to conclude uh, uh, with, for, for in particular for people in the audience that are more interested in the PD aspects of this theory. Uh, with a glimpse of uh, the relationship of this that I have told you with parametric multidimensional calculus on variation and with convex integration techniques. So let me say something about this. So this theory, you will see has some profound links with parametric multidimensional calculus of variation. And indeed, let me emphasize that the regularity for stationary point of non-convex functionals is still widely open, even in the graphical setting. So what is this setting? So you consider energies defined on Lipschitz graphs that are of the following type. You take an energy EF of U that is simply the integral over omega of F of the gradient of U. F here is, an, is a function that is quasi-convex in this space of matrices. For people that are not familiar, you can imagine really quasi-convexity as the analog of the Almgren ellipse, strict ellipticity. Okay, so uh, in this setting, you can still define what a stationary point is for EF, for the energy defined by F. And this is obtained by two steps, being critical for outer variation, which means that you deform U in the range by deformation in the range, and critical for inner variations, which means that you deform U in the domain. So you deform first the domain and then you compose with the graph U. So these are two different variations that you can do that gives you an outer variation and an inner variation. The combination of both, if you are stationary for both, you are a stationary point. Now, uh, let me emphasize that there is a canonical way to define a function small f given an integrand for varifolds capital F such that a Lipschitz graph U is stationary for EF, if and only if the corresponding manifold, density one manifold, is stationary for the integrand capital, capital F. And why I'm saying this, because in codimension bigger or equal than two, the question whether Lipschitz stationary point for quasi-convex integrands are smooth is still open, okay? This is a diff open and difficult to predict. So there are some results that are the following. For minimizers, so not just stationary, but really minimizers, so you can use com competitors. There was an important result by Evans, that is a partial regularity theorem in the 80s. While for critical points just for outer variation, so very weak critical points, so they just satisfy the outer variation, there were groundbreaking counterexamples by Mueller, Schwerach, and Segelidi, who provided these counterexamples by convex integration techniques. So where are we? We are exactly in the middle. So we are not minimizers as uh, in the result of Evans. We are not just critical for other variations as in the works by Mueller, Berak, and Zekelidi. We are stationary for inner and outer variation. Okay, what can we say for graphs that are uh, stationary for this inner and outer variation? Uh, uh, okay, so you may wonder. Can I use similar techniques as the one proved uh, used by Mueller, Sverak, and Sekelidi to give counterexample? The answer to this question is no. And this is the content of this result that is contained in the same paper with Ricardo Chione I was mentioning before. We show that essentially, um, uh, the, uh, morally speaking, the result is telling you the techniques of Mueller, Sverak, Sekelidi cannot be applied. What we prove more specifically is that if F satisfies the atomic condition, the only young measures generated by the deep curl inclusions, so by these differential inclusions, 
that are the one associated to anisotropic energies are the trivial Young measure. Okay? And actually, let me emphasize that this answer a question that was posed by the Lellis, the Philippis, Hirschheim, and Tione in their uh, recent paper in 2019. Oh, I see there is something in the chat. Ah, yes, I will. Ah, let me continue. I will do it later. Um, okay. Um, okay, so uh, this, this is more or less what I wanted to say about the uh, convex integration uh, connections. And let me conclude with the very last, some very last uh, ideas. So uh, there, there has been a very recent result by Rabaza, the Filippis, Hirsch, and uh, Philip Rindler. Uh, they have proved that if you are not interested in the rectifiability of the wall manifolds, but just in the space component, so in the mass of the manifolds, then it's enough to use our AC1 condition, okay? So I already said that for the rectifiability of manifolds, you need, it's necessary and sufficient to have AC. But if you just want the rectifiability of the space component, so of the mass of the manifold, you just need AC1 which essentially in codimension one means you just need the weak convexity of the functional, okay? So the question here then remains, in high codimension, are there int integrants that you know satisfying uh, the AC1 condition? So the same question you have for AC holds also for this uh, condition. And again with Ricardo, we introduce a, another condition that is the scalar atomic condition one, which is essentially a lower bound, an upper bound on the tests of the uh, projection operator DFT, which has the good property of being necessary for the validity of this AC1 condition. And why is this result useful? Because in, uh, together with uh, Riccardo Tione, we also proved that the scalar atomic condition one that we introduce is open in the C1 topology. So in particular, we deduce that an epsilon C1 neighbor of the area functional satisfies the, uh, the AC1 condition. And in particular, you can use it for this result of Rabasa, the Filippi, Sirsch, and Rindler. But not only that, we have also a, an example of energies which are far away from the area functional. And essentially, these are the LP norms, okay? We can show that if you are in the, the Grassmannian 2-4, so the two-dimensional Grassmannian in R4, we can prove that LP norms, I should be more specific what I mean with LP norms. They are essentially obtained taking the LP norm on the coefficients of the two vectors. So you can see the two Grassmannian elements as two vectors. You can expand them in their coefficients. You have a, six a base made of six components. And if you take the LP norm of these coefficients, you will see that this energy in ICO dimension, far away from the area functional, even in C1 topology, we prove that it satisfies the scalar atomic condition one. And in particular, it satisfies the rectifiability theorem uh, above. And these are the first example uh, far away from the area functional. Now, some numerical simulations we have uh, show that this LP norm satisfies even the scalar atomic condition. So the full rectifiability theorem we prove, but this is very, very technical to prove. And this is something we are doing, but it requires a huge effort proving the full scalar atomic condition. So this is a work in progress we have, but we still don't have the conclusive analytical proof of this last line. So, um, uh, hopefully soon it will be out, but for now we still don't have it. So this is everything I wanted to tell for today. So thank you very much for your attention and I hope I didn't go over time. Thank you very much. Thank you.